Thank you very much for that extremely generous um, introduction. Uh, anyway, it's a great pleasure to be here with you this morning. Um, I hope I don't uh, traverse ground that you have already uh, heard about and discussed. Um, uh, and uh, what I'm proposing to do is maybe speak for 30, 35 minutes, and then we can have a discussion. So I think the topic I've been given is the economic vision of Sri Lanka. Um, now, there is a, you've probably heard already, there's a Vision 2025 policy document, uh, which was unveiled in September 2017. And you've probably also heard that uh, the kind of tagline is knowledge-based, highly competitive social market economy. I thought it would be instructive to start by trying to unpack that and trying to understand the different elements uh, of that tagline. Um, in, in terms of the growth model for Sri Lanka, in terms of the impetus for growth, um, it has to come from export transformation. Clearly, if you have a domestic market of 20, 21 million people and uh, purchasing power uh, in nominal terms of 4,000 uh, USD, um, you can't drive 5 6% growth on a sustained basis by uh, focusing only on the domestic market. So it has to be exports uh, that drive, uh, drive uh, the um, growth on a sustained basis. And secondly, um, in terms of knowledge-based, why does it have to be knowledge-based? With per capita income of 4,000 as a low, low middle-income country, we can no longer leverage competitiveness through wages. Uh, we have to create relatively high value jobs, which means that we have to focus on education, training, and skills development, particularly on the STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering, maths, and we need to also make sure we have a good access to international language in terms of English. So our education, training, and um, skills development system has to be catered to um, basically employment at a relatively high value level. Uh, so that's why we say a knowledge-based economy. Highly competitive, globalization places a very high premium on competitiveness. Uh, I, uh, many years ago, in the, in the early 90s, um, when I was living in London, uh, there is, I don't know how many of you know Professor Magnat Desai, Lord Magnat Desai now. He was a professor at LSE who was, comes from a, the left tradition. He was very much a, a, a left-leaning economist. And he was speaking on globalization in its very early days. This was in the early 90s. So I went there um, expecting to hear a complete critique of globalization from an from a eminent leftist economist. But lo and behold, I, had, I heard a completely different narrative. He said, this is the time for the developing world because there's going to be such a high premium <laughs> placed on competitiveness. We have the advantage in terms of, la uh, of labor costs, and we need to leverage that. And the economies which are able to provide a conducive environment, because international capital doesn't see uh, nationality, it doesn't see race, color, creed. It goes to where it can get a rate of return. And this is what we've seen in the last 20, 25 years. We've seen capital flow out to the developing world, and we've seen a much higher proportion of GDP uh, being generated uh, in the developing world. Asia has been particularly successful. Uh, China, of course, leading the way. Um, so globalization and, its, and the premium it attaches on competitiveness provides an opportunity, also challenges. Those countries which are able to get themselves lean and mean, to have the right policy framework, to have stability, uh, do well. Uh, so that's why we say a highly competitive economy, because that's, that's uh, the bottom line in terms of uh, having sustained growth and development. Uh, you have to be a competitive economy. We say social market. Because Sri Lanka has historically been an overperformer in terms of the social indicators. 
if you look at the uh, UNDP's Human Development Indicator, uh, if you look at performance on the Millennium Development Goals, Sri Lanka has overachieved. We've had free education and free health from before independence. Uh, so we don't want to lose that legacy. So it has to be a social market economy, whereby we protect what we have in terms of our health, education, and social welfare. So that's, those are the different elements of the why knowledge-based, why highly competitive, why social market uh, economy. That's the vision, that's the tagline for the vision, and uh, I hope I've given you a little bit of color on each of the elements uh, of that tagline. Now, let me move on. In what I next want to talk about is, um, is the macroeconomic fundamentals of the economy. Clearly, in my position, that, that's what I have to kind of uh, uh, breathe uh, almost uh, every second of my uh, waking hours. And it's important for Sri Lanka because at the time of independence in 1948, we were second to Japan on almost every indicator. Clearly, we've slipped back. First, you had the, the four tiger economies, then the four NIEs, and now other economies. And one of the causal factors for our regression has been macroeconomic stress. If you caricaturize the Sri Lankan economy, particularly, let's take the period from 1977 when we, when we liberalized the economy. It has been a high budget deficit, high inflation, high nominal interest rate, and overvalued currency economy. So I'm oversimplifying, but that's basically the caricaturization of our economy. Now, if you compare that with what has happened in the successful Eastern Southeast Asian countries, we are almost 180 degrees the opposite. Now, why, why has it been so difficult to contain the budget deficit? Right from the time of independence, we've had a rather toxic combination of populist politics on the one hand, and a rather deeply entrenched entitlement culture among the people on the other. And these two have kind of fed off each other. It's been a non-virtuous cycle, whereby populist politics and this entrenched culture kind of feed off each other. I mean, we, we blame our politicians, which is true, they should be blamed. But we have to blame ourselves, because we also expect we have this entitlement culture. We expect the politicians to deliver, uh, you know, um, uh, goodies and... and uh, uh, we expect kind of preferential treatment, and it, it, there is this cycle which has dragged us down. And that has been the causal factor behind our budget deficits. Essentially, the public purse has to be used to, to kind of oil this system. It's a very patronage-based system. That's pulled us down. How did we get away with it for so long and, you know, still manage okay? It's because we were the second country after Chile to liberalize the economy in 1977. Of those countries which went down the, the autarkic dirigis route, we were the second after Chile to liberalize. So the traditional donors were very keen to demonstrate good development outcomes in a country which had a liberal polity, a democratic polity, and liberal economic policies. So we got extremely generous levels of foreign aid, which, with benefit of hindsight, it's now apparent, was not good for us. Because it enabled us to live beyond our means, not to do the tough things to make ourselves competitive, and really we kind of flo floated along without really you know, developing uh, uh, competitive knowledge-based economy which we're trying to develop now. Um, so what has changed? Why is it now necessary for us to be more disciplined, more uh, 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 structured in the way we do things? And that is because in about 2009,
We graduated from low-income to low-middle-income country status. So we no longer have access to foreign aid. Earlier, we had large amounts of foreign aid. As I said, the traditional donors were very keen to support us. And 60, 65% of that money came from the concessional windows of the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank. So we're talking about 10-year grace periods, 40-year maturity, less than one-year administration charge. That's the kind of money that was being infused into the system. So suddenly that started dwindling. But we were fortunate, or unfortunate, depending on which way you look at it, because at that time, 2008-9, you had the global financial crisis and the major central banks sloshing vast amount of liquidity into the system. Yields are very low in the advanced countries. We were able to go and borrow money in the international capital market. So we were able to substitute for the dwindling foreign aid by increasing our borrowing from international capital markets very significantly. So, but that was okay. But the problem was we did the borrowing without getting export development. Our exports, which were 33% of GDP in 2000, this is goods only, came down to 12.5%. So exports are coming down, our foreign commercial borrowing went up. So that has put us in a very difficult situation now. I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later when I come to debt management. But this macroeconomic stress that we've had has been a major contributory factor in terms of why we have not been uh, as successful as some of our neighbors to the east, east of us. All right, so let me um, now talk about what, what is being done to address this. How do we get away from this macroeconomic stress and the underlying problem, which for me, which has been one of the, I mean, there have been lots of other factors as well, which have um, contributed to us not progressing as fast as we could have done. Um, but uh, for, as I said, this macroeconomic uh, stress has been a crucial factor. So what is being done to address that? There are four frameworks that are being put in place. One is on the fiscal side. As I said, that's been the underlying problem, the unsustainable budget deficits. The government is in the midst of a revenue enhancement based fiscal consolidation program to bring our budget deficit down to 3.5% of GDP. It's, this year, it's likely to be a little over 5%. Um, and I say revenue enhancement based because actually our overall expenditure level is about 20% of GDP, which is comparable. If you look at our rating comparators, that's roughly where they are at. So our overall level of expenditure is not too high, but the quality can be improved, you know, in terms of pr prioritization, uh, in terms of supporting this vision we have for the growth model, there can be uh, uh, expenditure switching. But the overall level is okay. It's on the revenue side that we have the problem. I had a stint in the finance ministry in the 80s and regularly we collected about 20% of GDP as revenue it slipped down to 11% of GDP. And there was some good reasons for it. Um, during the 27-year conflict, the government had to give a lot of tax holidays and incentives, etc., to keep business going, to get projects over the hurdle rate of return. And in the process, it lost a lot of revenue. So you could understand why that happened. So now we've got to build revenue up again. It's about 13.7, 14% of GDP. But we need to get it up to 16. And then, if you, you know, 16, 17%. And then with this 3.5% of GDP uh, budget deficit, we get to 20% of expenditure. Uh, and we think a 3.5% of GDP can be sustainably financed without it putting too much pressure uh, in terms of our debt dynamics. So that's the framework f 
for the on the fiscal side, and the government has taken some tough measures. It has introduced a new Indian Revenue Act, uh, which has made the structure simpler. It has widened the base. Uh, it has increased the VAT rate from 10 to 15 percent. Uh, it has uh, introduced an automatic pricing formula for fuel, uh, and it's in the process of working towards the pricing formula for electricity. On the SOE side, um, that's been a major problem for us, loss-making SOEs. Uh, and there, the five major uh, loss-making state-owned enterprises have, have put out what they call statements of intent, whereby the certain measures in terms of corporate governance, uh, in terms of their financial operations, so there is a framework that's been set out against which you can benchmark their performance now. And we are beginning to see some improvement. Of course, part of their debt was the, you know, the subsidies that were there for electricity and fuel. For instance, the uh, 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 electricity board and the petroleum corporation made massive losses, some inefficiencies, but most of the losses were because they were selling below cost. And the government didn't give them the money. <laughs> they made them subsidize uh, the electricity and petrol, but they didn't often give them the transfers to finance it. So they had very large uh, um, losses, which were then parked on the balance sheets of the state banks, which then, of course, tended to compromise the integrity of the balance sheets of the state banks as well. So those distortions are now being addressed. We've got an automatic fuel formula. We need to get the electricity uh, formula done as well. Uh, so there have been quite significant improvements in terms of fiscal uh, performance. And we are beginning to see results. For the f only the second time since 1954, uh, last year, there was a primary surplus in the budget. So that if you take the revenue out, because uh, sorry, if you take interest payments out, because interest payments really reflect what has happened in the past. You take interest payments out, the government's operations were in surplus. So that was, uh, uh, at least that's big, uh, a reflection that the fiscal situation is beginning to improve. And as that has been the underlying causal factor for the ma macroeconomic stress, hopefully we are in, going in the right direction. On the central bank side, we are moving to a flexible inflation targeting regime, which is essentially a more forward-looking, data-driven, proactive monetary policy, whereby you try to anchor inflation expectations in the future. And you set your monetary policy looking at what inflation expectations are, and then because of the lags involved, the transmission lags involved in monetary policy, hopefully then, uh, you can have a, 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 a sustained um, inflation within the target. The government sets the target for the inflation, which is 4 to 6 percent, and then the central bank is required to hit that target. And to support that, we're in the process of amending the Monetary Law Act, which is the foundational piece of legislation for establishing the central bank, and the amendments are being designed to give the central bank greater independence. With that will come greater accountability as well. Um, and um, essentially going forward, the central bank will not be able to, will not be permitted to buy government treasury bills. So we will not monetize the fiscal deficit anymore. The government has to manage on its own. We won't print money to support the budget, which is what we've done in the past on a regular basis. So, or nor will we give them provisional advances, pay fees, there have been various ways in which the central bank has monetized the government's deficit, uh, which has meant that, it, it, you know, essentially you end up having a high inflationary environment with the central bank constantly printing money through its acceptance of treasury bills. So that will not be permitted by law once the amendment goes through. Already we've started doing it, um, but uh, this will be uh, reinforced by a legal amendment. On the um, exchange rate side, that's all very topical at the moment. A number of our emerging market 
countries are facing exchange rate pressure because there is an outflow of capital. Uh, again, we are trying to set in, put in place a framework. Uh, we are want to manage the exchange rate in a flexible way. In the past, we have tended to try to defend a, a fixed rate. We've had a rate, uh, and we, when it came under pressure, we used our reserves to defend that rate. And we've had episodes, for instance, in 2012, we used 4 billion US dollars of our reserves. But then in the end, had to depreciate by almost 14% anyway, to devalue by 14%. In 2015, I, I'm using these dates because they're different governments. All governments did the same thing. Uh, in 2015, $3 billion of our reserves were spent. Our total reserves are $8 billion, So you can think of 4 and $3 billion being spent. And again, we had to devalue the currency by about 9%. So clearly, trying to, you know, depleting reserves to defend a fixed rate doesn't make sense. So this time around, we've allowed a gradual depreciation. We have intervened in the market. We have spent some of our reserves but to prevent disorderly depreciation of the currency. So we've allowed a gradual adjustment of the currency. And up to now, it has been useful because we have got to where we should be from a competitiveness point of view because the real effective exchange rate is 100 now. So that reflects that the currency is now at a competitive level. And hopefully we can manage it to be around this level, but of course that at the moment with capital outflows going out, uh, it's, it, there is uncertainty. But we feel we've, we've taken certain measures in terms of curbing imports, um, which I, we hope will enable us to stabilize the exchange rate at around this level, uh, where we feel it's a competitive exchange rate. Though as part of a flexible inflation, target, uh, inflation targeting monetary policy regime, uh, you can't target both the exchange rate and inflation at the same time. So the exchange rate has to take the burden of adjustment. So you have to run a flexible exchange rate system. Then let me come to liability management. I told you that we uh, kind of shifted from foreign aid to commercial borrowing. Uh, and, and that exports came down at the same time. On top of that, some of the borrowing was used for projects which are not giving us a, a decent rate of return. So all that came together and now we have a major challenge in terms of our external debt dynamics. Our debt to GDP is about 77%. The median for our rating peers is about 50, 55%. So we are an outlier. Uh, we have to we have some bunching of external debt payments uh, in the next four or five years. Uh, but we are fairly confident that we can manage that. Not fairly, but very confident we can manage that. And we've improved the architecture for liability management by introducing a new active liability management act. It was passed by parliament in April. And what that does is to give us more headroom and flexibility to manage our obligations which are coming up in a bunched way over the next four or five years. In the past, the government's borrowing was limited to its borrowing requirement in that given year. So let's say that the borrowing requirement was a, a billion rupees in that year, you couldn't borrow more than that to build buffers for future obligations. Now, given our uh, liability uh, servicing, our debt obligations in the coming years, we need to now go into the market opportunistically when it's favorable and raise money and build these buffers to be able to have a smooth uh, repayment of our future obligations. And this is what this Liability Management Act does. It enables us now to borrow above that borrowing requirement. There is a limit. It's, uh, the limit is 
Now, for instance, we are just parliament. We just we are going to parliament. Uh, all this has to be approved by parliament. Um, uh, each time you do it, you have to get it approved by parliament. So it's not a kind of license to go off and borrow as you want. We've asked for 310 billion dollar limit to do liability management in the coming year. And the idea is we will go. And up to now, we have had 11 international sovereign bond issuances. They've all been dollar denominated because the dollar interest rates have been so low. But now we are diversifying. We got a term loan of a billion dollars from China on very good terms. Money came in just yesterday. We are looking at the panda bond market to issue uh, a, a sovereign bond in, 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 on the onshore China market. We are looking to issue samurai bonds in Japan with a JBIC guarantee. We are looking in the Middle East at Sukuk bonds. Also, we, are, we have made some headway in um, coming to swap agreements with a couple of central banks in the Middle East. So essentially, we are diversifying our investor base. We are diversifying our instruments so that we have this capacity to raise the money to roll over these liabilities which are coming up over the next uh, so many years. But I should say that all this is just a holding operation. The way to get out of this challenge that we have in terms of external debt is by increasing our receipts. We have to increase exports of goods and services. That is the only way you can actually, uh, two, two ways. One is the government uh, fiscal performance has to improve. The government's fu present and future borrowing requirements have to come down, which then pr takes the pressure off in terms of the accumulation of debt. And you have to increase your capacity to service debt by your own earnings rather than through additional borrowings. So that's really the challenge now. Fiscal consolidation, export growth. So I've talked to you about fiscal consolidation. Let me now move on to what we're doing about export growth. Do you have Mrs. Malbate yesterday? Yes, okay, so then you know all about the uh, national export, yeah, all that you know. So I won't, I won't cover that. So that is really the challenge. We have to make that work. Because unless we improve our export earnings, uh, we are going to have a real, real challenge. We're not going to get out of the problem, put it that way. We are just doing, a, the central bank and the treasury are doing a holding operation now, essentially, by rolling over this debt. We have created the architecture to help us roll over the debt. Um, and hopefully, Sri Lanka has never missed a single payment uh, in terms of its debt servicing. So hope we have a good track record. And we hope to be able to keep rolling this debt over. And buy time to get this fiscal consolidation and the export growth, which will then help us to uh, get out of a rather challenging uh, debt dynamics uh, framework. So what else are we doing to, to um, uh, exports? You, you've heard about, so I'm not going to go there. Um, what else are we doing to, to, to support this vision of a knowledge-based, highly competitive social market economy. The government is also having reforms on each of the factor markets. Uh, land is a big problem in terms of getting land for, to start businesses, etc. Uh, also, the efficiency of our crop mix and land use is another issue. So there's a major review of land use and crop mix, and also the land Ownership rights of foreign companies is being liberalized. Plus, there is an electronic land bank that is being created. There's a lot of land. The state owns a lot of land. 80% of the land in this country is owned by the state. And there is a lot of valuable real estate that belongs to the railway department, to the post office department. In all the towns around the country, there is real estate that's just kind of lying fallow uh, where re value can be released. So all this land is being kind of create, uh, is being collected up. Land that's available uh, to, for the release of value through business uh, creation. Uh, it, and that will be put into an electronic land bank now. So that process is actually quite, it's very advanced and hopefully the land bank uh, will be um, opened up soon. 
And in terms of cap in the in terms of factor market, secondly capital market, there's a new Securities and Exchange uh, uh, Commission bill, uh, and we are creating a new separate board uh, for SMEs, uh, and an attempt to also develop venture capital, private equity, angel capital, all that. There's a kind of a major effort to get our capital markets uh, working more efficiently. Because that also becomes important because given the fact that we have limited fiscal space, we are in the process of a fiscal consolidation program, clearly the growth um, momentum has to come from the private sector. Uh, and so capital market development has been an important part of supporting capital, uh, private sector driven uh, uh, growth model. As far as labor is concerned, um, a, a, a major challenge is for us to get our la female labor force participation up. Uh, because we are, I mean, I think the, the, the slogan is uh, we, we are uh, uh, getting old before we get rich. Uh, Sri Lanka is unique, I think, in terms of beginning to experience a demographic transition before we have a major economic transformation. And why that has happened is because we have been extremely successful in educating the girl child. Female enrollment ratios right through the education system are extremely impressive. There are more girls in tertiary education than there are boys. And even if you look at the professions, the medical profession, accountancy profession, foreign service, I think 80, 90 percent of your intake were well, ladies, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, uh, so we've, we've, we've uh, educated girls, but their presence in the labor force is very low. Male labor force participation is over 70 percent. Female labor force participation is 36, 37 percent. So we have to, f particularly with this aging problem, we have to increase female labor force participation. And we need to look at, uh, you know, daycare facilities, public transport, uh, part and flexi time, you know, all those things that make it more, that make it possible for women to, cult to carry out the multitasks they have. I don't think there's going to be rapid cultural change which is going to relieve women from their multitasks or where men are going to share more. I don't think so. But, so, but we have to find ways of facilitating their participation in the labor force. So that's hap those are the kind of things that are happening in terms of the factor markets. What's happening in terms of the business environment? I, if Tilan is coming, he'll probably talk to you about this. But the government, one thing it has done in terms of the business climate is it has set up task forces related to each of the 10 pillars of the ease of World Bank's Ease of Doing Business Index. And um, the idea w was to come up with action plans as to how to improve our performance on those pillars so that our overall rating uh, can be improved. And there, uh, those action plans have been completed and it's been put into a kind of a, a, a co composite action plan which is being rolled out. So on each of these pillars, um, efforts are being made to deregulate. If you had eight steps before, you bring it down to four or five. Uh, we've infused technology where, where necessary to make, uh, make the processes more uh, uh, facilitating. Uh, so that is being rolled out with assistance from the World Bank. On investment promotion, uh, Board of Investment is now oper is about to operate in a much more focused way. Uh, there is a more effective one-stop shop that is being put together. Uh, also, in terms of investment promotion, they've identified some priority sectors, and within those priority sectors, they are tr identifying an potential anchor investors. For instance, in Vietnam, in the early days of their transformation, Samsung accounted for 40% of their exports. Uh, I know in Costa Rica, Intel accounted for something like 70, 75% of their exports. So if you can get a couple of major anchor investors, they can help you to get that initial uh, 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 transformative uh, impact. So the Board of Investment, they're working with the um, Center for International Development at Harvard, you know, Professor Ricardo Hausman and his team, to really to, to gear up our Board of Investment's work 
so that it's much more focused in certain subsectors, and within subsectors, we are trying to target uh, anchor investors. Then trade uh, facilitation and trade policy. You, you probably, again, heard Ganesh and others would have talked about, right? Trade facilitation and trade policy. So I, I mean, these trade agreements that we are negotiating, uh, others would have spoken about it. Uh, I'm very happy to discuss it in greater detail. But other than to say, you know, probably our biggest asset is our location. You know, for millennia we have been a trading post in the middle of the Indian Ocean. Our archaeological sites have, found, have had uh, Roman coins on one side and Chinese coins on the other. Uh, you know, and uh, in between Omani uh, coins from the, uh, the Oman Empire, etc. So this is for millennia. We've been kind of traders. In our post-independence period, our DNA changed a little bit, and we've been much more inward-looking. We need to go back to our roots, really, to where, what we were, which was essentially a trading post in the middle of the uh, Indian Ocean, which we were for millennia. So we are trying to do that. And in the process, we're trying to, uh, given the fact that the Uruguay round and the multilateral trade negotiations have got stuck, we are trying through, and, and South Asia has its own challenges in terms of its regional uh, uh, integration. Um, so we are trying to do these bilateral uh, trade agreements. You would have heard the detail of it. Uh, so as you know, we have one with Singapore, a, a partnership agreement. We have an agreement uh, in goods with India, which we are trying to deepen, and we are trying to broaden it out to include services, investment, training technology, etc. a similar one with China. Uh, also uh, negotiating with Bangladesh and Thailand, and there are others. All that I'm sure you would have heard from Ganesh and the others. But one key point to drive home is, if we are able to successfully negotiate an agreement with China, we would be the only country in the world with preferential access to China, India, and Europe. Europe through G G GSP+. Plus. No other country has preferential access to all those three large markets. And when 190 countries are chasing FDI, that is a key differentiator, which you can sell. And you sell that side by side with the fact that we are 20 miles from the fastest growing large economy, which is India. We are smack bang in the middle of China's maritime silk route. We have easy access to the Middle East, East Africa, etc equidistance between Europe and the Far East. So there are tremendous locational advantages. Plus, if you have this preferential access to these three large markets, clearly if you bring all that together, there's enormous promise as far as the future is concerned for Sri Lanka, provided, of course, we have sound macro stability, sound political stability. If you get that, you bring that all together. I'm going to quickly finish. Have, you know, the large projects, you probably heard, Megapolis, etc. they've heard about. Okay, so then you're getting people to talk about. Megapolis, yeah. City, yeah. and then Trinco. Trinco, Hambantha de Gaulle, and, and Tandy as well. So, so the, all this is being supported by these, there's a large kind of economic corridor from Trincomalee in the northeast coming through Kandy in the center of the country, Kurunagala in the north, uh, 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 central, uh, sorry, north, uh, Kene, northwest, then Colombo, and down to Hamantota. Uh, 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 you know, there is this thing about China and the debt trap. I think I need to also <laughs> address that because that has become an issue. Our debt to China at the moment accounts for about 12% of our debt stock. Uh, and we are seeing a pivot from lending to equity. The investment in the Hambantha port is equity. The investment in the port city is equity. The investment in the Chinese terminal in Colombo port is equity. Um, so we are beginning to see the Chinese are not dumb. They know that we are, have, we are you know, we have challenges in, in terms of debt servicing, so, you know, they are moving more to equity. Um, the other thing is, um, it's up to us. 
you know, if we are going to borrow, we have to do the screening properly. We have to evaluate the projects. We have to make sure the projects have a, have a reasonable rate of return. If we take on money for useless projects, you can't blame the Chinese. I mean, that's, you know, uh, <laughs> sub, uh, our performance is subpar. Uh, so that, that's, that's uh, essentially what we need to do. We need, China has the capital. Uh, we need to access Chinese capital, but we need to make sure that we screen and evaluate and make sure that the money comes into projects that gives us a rate of return. Uh, so, and, and also the, 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 the string of pearls argument, I have difficulty uh, in subscribing to that uh, because the Hamantota port, China was the third choice. It was first offered to India, then offered to Japan, and finally to China. Even they were not so, not so keen, to be honest. We had to, it was a hard sell on our part to get them to do it. But that was the China pre-President Xi. I know uh, President Xi's China is more, is different and, and more, more outward looking in its policies. Uh, but we don't see uh, uh, China pushing us uh, in terms of furthering its own strategic uh, interests. We, we, we see enormous potential in a commercial relationship with China. We see enormous potential in a commercial relationship with India. We see enormous potential in a commercial relationship with Europe. So we, you know, we, we, we have international relations with every, a good international relations with everybody. It is not a zero, exactly, it's not a zero sum game. We see it very much as a positive sum game. And we want to take advantage of our God-given excellent location, side by side with very good international relation, to mobilize the capital that we need, the market access that we need, the know-how that we need to put our country on a much accelerated trajectory of development. Thank you. Thank you very much.